Dear Iber, dear students, dear alumni, dear colleagues, dear friends, welcome. My name is Rodolphe Durand. I'm the founder and academic director of the SNO uh, Institute, Society and Organization Institute. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you and a great honor to welcome Hubert Jolie uh, to HEC Paris. Not only Hubert, because you obviously represent the school's excellence and outreach, and you are a role model for students and alumni. Your career is bright indeed. After HEC, you are namely a partner at McKinsey Company, the CEO, a senior executive at Vivendi, the CEO of Carson Company, and the CEO of Best Buy, but also because you think, do, and inspire our future, what you call the next era of capitalism. A capitalism starting by taking real cognizance that business is essentially about purpose, people, and human relationships before profit. In this way, you embody, at best, purposeful leadership that HEC strives to think, teach, and act for. This is what the school is committed to do, especially through the Society and Organization Institute. In this respect, we are glad and grateful to think further with Uber, the true purpose of organization and of individuals, and on the role of the leader in making them emerge and connecting them. We're also proud that with the Jolly Family Chair for Purposeful Leadership, today 100% of our students are trained to question their purpose, to find the meaning of their job, and to the various issues for a more responsible capitalism. As chairman and chief executive officer at Best Buy, Hubert has showed and proved his way, as he coins it, to unleash the human magic. Not only has he turned Best Buy from an ailing company to an industry leader, but he has also made it rated one of the best places to work in the US. He has namely been recognized as one of the top 30 CEOs in the world by Barron's and one of the top 10 CEOs in the US by Glassdoor. Today, Hubert Jolie is a senior lecturer at the Harvard Business School, in addition to several uh, non-executive mandates in large companies, uh, boards such as Johnson & Johnson. Last year, Hubert Jolie wrote a best-selling and highly acclaimed book, The Heart of Business, Leadership Principles for the Next Era of Capitalism, which is today available in French. He has also been recognized as one of the top 50 management thinkers in the world by Thinker50 and received the organization 2021 Leadership Award. As many reasons why we are deeply pleased and grateful to be able to learn from your experience and your insight. So thank you very much, Hubert, for being with us today. And I leave the floor, the floor for an open discussion to you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's an absolute honor. Um, thank you for selecting us, and I hope that I do the Executive MBA class of 2023 really proud in interacting with you today. <laughs> so over the last few days, we've had quite a lot of discourse on rethinking leadership mm -hmm. and the fact that there's definitely an urgency in rethinking leadership. Now, with the lens of the employee and the individuals whom we lead in organizations today, what do you think that these individual employees pressing expectations, um, and how do those expectations play an important role in this requirement of us as leaders to rethink how we lead? Oh, I very much look forward to our conversation uh, and questions from, from the audience as well. What, what, what I think we know is that the leadership model of the 20th century, which was the leader as the superhero who knows all of the answers and is eager to uh, tell everybody how smart they are and tell everybody what they need to do, that doesn't work. Uh, nobody wants to follow. Raise your hand if you want to follow a leader like this. Definitely not. OK, all right. So there's 0%, right? Um, I think that the when I look at the best leaders I know today and what employees are looking for, there's some adjectives that, uh, that come to mind. Um, I think one of them is uh, authenticity, uh, being, uh, you know, having a leader who is clear about their own purpose, the purpose in life. And uh, the other adjective would be, or the, the other words would be around uh, vulnerability, humility, and empathy. Uh, it's, uh, I think in the context of the Great Resignation 
and the pandemic that, we are, that we've been going through, the human connection is essential, right? If we, so if you take the employees that were working remotely, uh, we now know their partners, their children, their dogs, their cats, their Wi-Fi problems. We see them as human beings, not just an employee. The same is true with frontline workers. We, we're concerned about their health, their well-being, and so forth. See, the ability to build true human connections uh, that are based on vulnerability and communication and empathy is, uh, is really essential. I think that, uh, so we're in France. Descartes uh, of the Cartesian philosophy once wrote that, uh, I think, therefore I am. I think he's wrong. It's I am seen, therefore I am. And so a key implication for leaders today is to build a true human connection with people around us. And that may start with being curious about who they are. So to give a concrete example, because everybody around the planet says people is the most important thing, so let's be concrete. We had a, we had a store general manager in Boston at Best Buy. He, uh, he, in this case, would ask every one of the employees in the store, about 100 of them, what is your dream? At Best Buy or outside of Best Buy, what is your dream? Right? He said, OK, write it down in the break room. And he said, my job is to help you achieve your dream. So I think these are the key words, authenticity, vulnerability, humility, uh, empathy, and building this human connection. Um, vulnerability and humility has become much easier. In the old days, again, as leaders, we were supposed to know everything. Now, raise your hand if two years ago you had the manual for how to deal with COVID. Raise your hand. You, no, you didn't have it? OK. Uh, and so, of course, we didn't know how to deal with COVID. We don't know how to deal with back to the office or this hybrid environment. So the best thing to, to say if we don't know is to say, I don't know. And we're going to have to figure this out together. So it's become so much easier to become a humble, you know, vulnerable leader today. Probably the silver lining of COVID. <laughs> Yes. Okay, I'll hand over to my colleague for the next question. Thanks so much. Uh, again, my pleasure. Uh, one of the questions that we had is related to aspects of P&L, or profit and loss, and how would you integrate the purposeful leadership in those type of discussions, which are, by essence, more likely driven from uh, economical aspects? Or Oh, so one thing I learned, so that's 30 years ago. It was at McKinsey at the time. I learned from one of my clients. I had great deals with my client. They would teach me a lot, and they would pay me. I had a great deal. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I learned from one of them, Jean-Marie Descarpentries, was uh, the purpose of a company, it was 30 years ago, the purpose of a company is not to make money. It's an imperative, right? Of course you have to make money. And it, but it's also an outcome. And he said, in business, you have three imperatives. You have the people imperative. You need to have good people who are well-trained, well-equipped, and so forth. You have the business imperative. You need to have customers who are happy, not telling you anything you don't know. And then you have the financial imperative, which is the result of excellence on the other two imperatives. And so then he said, there's very concrete implications around this. Uh, one is uh, how you run your monthly, let's say, business review meeting. Probably every one of you, right, run it. before coming to the MBA, you had a monthly performance review or business management meeting. He said, start the meeting with discussing people and organization, then go to business, then finish with finance. If you start with finance, you're going to spend the entire meeting, Nicola, on financial results, and you won't have time on the others, which are the drivers. So you have to flip it and really treat profit as an outcome uh, and not the goal. The analogy for me would be you know, your general practitioner. If your general practitioner was entirely focused on your temperature, your fever, your symptoms, that would not be good. You'd like them to be focused on your health. So I think it's the same. And clearly, we've seen there's many, many examples, maybe at your own companies or at Best Buy. You know, the share price went from $11 to $110 in nine years, uh, and even, even though everybody thought we were going to die. And this was because we had a very human-centric approach to the, to the turnaround. So you can derive extraordinary, in fact, irrationally good financial performance not by focusing on it, but focusing on people and business, as well as now all of the other stakeholders in the business. Thank 
you. So sticking on this theme of um, stakeholders, how do we as leaders really ensure that we critically consider keeping our stakeholders continually involved in the process? And then I guess a little bit more of a challenge is with the lens of climate change. Yeah, so um, I think you know, what we need to do today is a declaration of interdependence. We used to believe, people used to believe that you, know, you could be successful in business just by focusing on the four walls of the business and ignore what was happening outside. Well, let me tell you. So Best Buy is headquartered in Minneapolis. So following the murder of George Floyd in May of 2020, the city is on fire. Well, you cannot open the stores, right? And to quote Rebecca Anderson, who is one of my colleagues at uh, HBS, if the planet is on fire, that's a huge business risk. In fact, Larry Fink of BlackRock believes or says that uh, climate change is the biggest risk we have. So I think that you know, this is a new context. And, and so you guys are, are training right, are in this EMBA and to be you know, some of the world's foremost leaders. Here's the scoop. And you probably guys know this already, right? The mission has changed. It used to be purely about profit optimization. Now it's about being a force for good in the world. Uh, it used to be about just the four walls of the business. Now you need to worry about all stakeholders. And then, so the, the mission has changed, the scope has changed, and then the role model, or the type of leadership has changed as we were discussing earlier. Now, other than the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, there's another pandemic in the world, which is the pandemic of zero sum games. The only way for this conversation to go well is if you guys are amazing and I'm terrible. No, that's crazy, right? We have to collaborate. Sometimes people ask you, should we take care of the customers uh, or the employees or the shareholders? It's all. Should we take care of the short term or the long term? Of course, both. And so our responsibility as leaders is to seek to embrace all of the stakeholders and create win-win-win outcomes. Now, specifically on climate change, you know, we have a ticking, we have a ticking time bomb on our hands, right? So let's be clear. And so, again, as business leaders, we have a choice. We can either ignore it and then face, you know, I have three amazing granddaughters, ages one to three. They're going to look to me and say, you know, they call me happy. How cool is that? They call me happy. <laughs> uh, uh, and they're going to look at me and say, what did you do? All right? And so it's, it's obvious. So you guys probably saw the Elderman report last week that looks at trust. Uh, in companies, in governments, media. Companies are the most trusted organizations these days, right? Which probably doesn't say much about the others, governments and media, unfortunately. But that means that uh, all stakeholders look up to companies as having the power to change the trajectory and to create a future that does not exist yet, but that needs to be better than what we have. So that's why you see all companies now, I think it's all companies, set you know, goals by 2030 or 2040 to be carbon neutral and, and get on that uh, journey. I know at Best Buy, you know, during my tenure, I think we reduce our carbon footprint by 60% and we're committed to carbon neutrality. Sometimes it's easy, right? So which, when we change the lights in the stores to LED lighting, the payback is about two years. How cool is that? Would you like to be more, to have more, you know, investment opportunities with the payback? <laughs> of course you do. And then there's some more challenging stuff, like you know, a lot of the stuff that uh, Best Buy, you know, which if you don't know, you've read the case, right? So you know, it's a consumer electronics retailer. We sell a lot of gear, we recycle them, but we're, we're far from having you know, a circular economy. So there's much more to be done, but it's clear that if we don't do it, you know, the ticking time bomb is gonna blow up, which would not be good. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'd like to step back once on the, on the financials. Uh, and You're the financial guy on the not team. Not that much. Yeah. I'm more into operations at okay, this part, right. but okay. these are the main So you, you, you've not painted yourself into a corner? No, no. no. Okay. That's typically, I mean, beyond the, the P&L, and you gave very good explanations on the change to be made. If we, if we push this down to the investors for public traded companies, uh, and the same story about um, how would you position purpose leadership, purposeful leadership in, uh, in relations with investors? So it depends a little bit. So if you go back to 2012, when everybody thought we were going to die, there was zero buy recommendation of the stocks, on the stock. If I had gone to the investors and said, we're going to do this uh, wonderful thing, it's going to be purposeful leadership, 
Uh, it's going to feel really good for everybody, and over time, it's going to produce great results. I don't think it would have created a lot of excitement. So the priority uh, in 2012 was, uh, you know, the ship was sinking, so make sure the ship doesn't sink. Sink. So it was a lot about fixing what was broken. Right? It was making sure prices were competitive, that the online shopping experience was good, the store experience was good, the partnership with all of the vendors, taking cost out, uh, and, and, and. So a lot of actions on the direct levers, which we did with a very human-centric approach, but it was not, purpose was not part of the discourse. And that was needed, and that way we, you know, we stabilized the company, and after three years, we said, all right, the turnaround is over, and we're going to embark on this new phase, building the new blue, with this new purpose and, and so forth. But the thing about investors, if you just talk to them, for the most part, they yawn. Right? When we did our Invest Today in November 2012, and we described what we were going to do with Renew Blue, they said, you know, we had zero credibility, so they, they said, we, we, and same when we announced building the new blue, you know, they tend to be skeptical. So don't expect when you do an invest today that people are going to jump, you know, on their seats and, and, and uh, scream of joy. That's not happening. But over time, I think what matters is the credibility you build. So the say-do ratio, you know, the, the previous team was saying a lot but not doing much. So we said, all right, let's say less and do more. That worked. Over time, though, I remember a shareholder meeting or a meeting with shareholders, an investor meeting, we actually told the shareholders, and there was about 40 of them in the room, I told them our purpose as a company is not to make money. And of course, the fact that our share price had gone by the time from $11 to maybe 75 or something was helpful, because uh, the fact that we say it's not the purpose doesn't mean we don't see it as a critical imperative and something we care deeply about, because they're taking care of our retirement funds, right? Certainly in the US, that's how you get retirement, so it's really important. But they did understand that uh, it was by pursuing this new purpose, it was by pursuing these new growth initiatives, it was uh, you know, by uh, creating this environment that would lead the employees to be the best, biggest version of themselves, that would, we would continue to create extraordinary outcomes. So my main philosophy with shareholders is to respect them, to love them, to listen to them, and then tell them the story and then deliver on it. And then they, they understand it. The best shareholders, the long shareholders, they know that it is not by slashing and burning. They're very smart. Uh, so they know a short-term focus is not going to do it. So they really want you to take care of the long term. In fact, and I'll finish with this, I will always remember in 2018 receiving this letter from Larry Fink. You know, this was uh, his first letter about purpose, and he said he was encouraging CEOs of companies in which they had a stake to declare their long-term strategy, declare their purpose, declare how they were going to create value for all stakeholders, because he knew that this was the right uh, thing to do. So shareholders, understand. there's no opposition between purpose and shareholders. They understand, the long shareholders completely understand that this is a great way to uh, create shareholder value. Thank you. I come from a, a value investor background where we take long positions in companies. So I, I have a sense of some of the pressure that you must have had in having those conversations and getting that buy-in. Um, moving to something a little bit more personal, um, what do you think would prevent a leader from being really purposeful? You've got to be brave and sometimes say things are not going so well and be extremely vulnerable. And we're leading a large organization that, that seems daunting. <laughs> so I think the, the first requirement for all of us leaders, I don't know what, you guys probably have, your own, certainly have your own views and theories. So for me, uh, you know, when, when during COVID, we couldn't go outside, we could go inside, right? And spending time with ourselves on who are we, what kind of a leader do we want to be? Uh, at the school in Boston, where we talk about, uh, where we, we have a workshop for new CEOs, we ask them to write down their retirement speech. And uh, my wife, Hortense Le Gentil, who is here, who's one of the world's foremost executive leadership coaches, she has her, her clients, CEOs and senior executives, to think about their eulogy. 
right? What people are going to say on that day when you're not here to, uh, uh, to listen. And so having this, you know, this anchor, you know, being anchored, being centered, being aligned with, you know, between who you are and who you want to be, that's the starting point of, of a great uh, purposeful leader. The other thoughts, um, you know, life is not linear. Who, who believes life is linear? That, you know, it's a straight line of improvement and there's never any fluctuation. Raise your hand. Okay, so, all right, so I'm not the only one. Uh, so there's going to be ups and there's going to be some downs. Uh, as a leader, really important not to be a thermometer, but more important to be a thermostat. So I will take a very concrete example. In January of 2014, uh, while we had had a number of good quarters, uh, in November, December of 2013, which is the important holiday season for Best Buy, <laughs> our performance was not great. And we had disappointing uh, sales. And so we thought that the, the market would not like that. Our share price had gone from 11 to 39. We thought they wouldn't like it. In fact, we were right. The share price went down from 39 to 26, okay, in one day. So we were right. Now, the day before we announced, we gathered all of the officers of the company. And I said, we have a choice tomorrow on how we show up. We can either show up and say, okay, we surrender, right? The naysayers were right. We're going to die. That was option one. Okay. Option two was say, no, we blew it. We missed. We made a number of mistakes. We're going to analyze these mistakes. We're going to get back on the saddle. We're going to, who likes uh, Batman, right? Why do we fall, Bruce? Right? So that we can learn to pick ourselves up. And so we said, we're going to you know, make the corrections that are appropriate and then get on with life. And uh, the share price did go down, but then we uh, recovered and you know, the rest of the, of the journey. So, Again, it's this idea that the leader is there to create the environment for, for the team to, to be the best they can be. And how we show up every day is a decision we make. We can show up and decide you know, every morning that we're going to be grumpy. We're not going to pay attention to people. We're not going to say hello. Or we can uh, decide that we're going to show up with a spring in our step, uh, listen to people, be, pay attention to people, and be more a thermostat and create energy than a thermometer and then, you know, have everybody freak out. So these are some of the lessons learned. You see that I have scars on my face. That's because I've learned along the way. You know? We'll take all the poles of wisdom we can get. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but this is leading straight, and that's a perfect transition to the next question, which is we see in the book a lot of moments where um, um, personal life balance and, and maybe I would summarize that into spiritualism or, or those type of contexts are seems to be something that is creating strength yes. for facing certain events. Would you wanna, and how would you push potentially these as well to be inspiring for the C-suits or, or, or whoever is in the leadership positions? Yes, so work-life balance almost has the idea that life is outside of work. Uh, and of course, we, we have multiple lives, right? We have our work life, our family life, uh, our life with friends, our spiritual life, our physical life. Uh, but work is part of life. Uh, a mistake I made for many years was that uh, I thought that to be a great leader, I needed to be smart. And I had my head cut off from the rest of my body because I thought it was all about head. You know, at McKinsey, I was a great problem solver. My parents gave me a few gray cells, and I, was, I thought that was what I needed to use. And what I've learned over the years is that uh, as leaders, we need to use all of our body parts. And that includes, of course, the head, but also the heart, the soul, the guts, the ears, the eyes. Um, and so the spiritual life of us as leaders is really important. Right? And last week at HBS, we did a, a seminar on putting purpose to work. And a number of CEOs come to talk to our students. And most of them talked about their spiritual life, how they're meditating every day. And reflecting. So make an appointment with yourself. All right? And in the morning, you know, think, or at the beginning of the week, think about what the week uh, entails and decide you know, how you want to show up. Or at the end of the day, go back and reflect on how the day uh, went. Uh, breathe. Be kind with yourself, by the way. One of the things I suffered from is chapter three in the book is uh, I thought that I needed to be perfect. 
problem with my mother's. Okay. Uh, by the way, when the book came out in the US, we were number three on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. So I told my mom. She said, you know, it's good to start low. <laughs> so think about you know, the challenges. Uh, and I said, Mom, because we had talked about it, Mom, this is your problem, right? The fact that you struggle with you know, uh, perfection, that's your, it's not my problem anymore. It's not my voice. And so be kind with yourself. If today you were not perfect, that's because you are human. My coach, Marshall Goldsmith, you know, encourages us to ask the question the following way, which is, today, did I do my best you know, to be a good leader, to take care, to, listen, to be attentive to the employees, or to do a good job with the shareholders, or what have you? Not was I perfect. Did I do my best? And if the answer is no, you know, I, I was a 6 out of 10, there's always tomorrow. Right? And if I don't know how to get better, I can ask for help. Best leadership phrase I've learned in the last few years is my name is Hubert and I need help. So I guess in following, my name is Nishat and I need help. And that's why I'm here. <laughs> um, I'd like to spend some time talking a little bit about recruitment. Uh, one of our favorite stories was about the two gentlemen who performed surgery on the dinosaur. It was a very serious business. Um, <laughs> when they were recruited, that obviously wasn't something that was spoken about. I mean, we didn't know they would become dinosaur doctors. Um, but how do you, and, and, and what would you say um, in recruiting individuals, is it about having the right people on the bus from the beginning? or getting them sort of to go along the journey with you, whilst also incorporating diversity and inclusion in your business. So you can't have everyone being the same. Yes, yeah, so, so many, many facets here um, of, the, of the question. The, the, my first answer would be, so as leaders, maybe the most important decision we make is who we put in positions of power, right? Because at the end of the day, there's very few things, you guys know this, right, that we can do individually, so it's more about what other people are going to do. Now, the mistake I made for a long time was to put a lot of emphasis on exper expertise and experience. I wanted the best you know, e-commerce person, or the best supply chain person, or the best CFO, or what have you. And it's not that expertise or experience are irrelevant, but I think increasingly I put emphasis on who is this person. All right? the, the best interview question I think I ever got was uh, when I was being interviewed to become the CEO of Carlson Companies by Marilyn Carlson Nelson, the daughter of the, of the founder, it was to replace her. I had an eight-hour interview. We were flying on a plane back from Paris to Minneapolis. And one of the questions she asked me, she had time, eight hours. One of the questions uh, that she asked me was, Hubert, tell me about your soul. Now, who asked this question? <laughs> and yet, when you think about it, it's such a great question. Now, I've never dared asking that question exactly like this. But the question I ask is, uh, well, tell me about yourself. Uh, tell me about what kind of a leader you are. Uh, you know, what are your ambitions? How do you want to be remembered? Uh, sometimes I go to the eulogy route. <laughs> uh, so who is this person? What kind of a leader are they going to be? And that's a, so that's a critical question. The point about diversity and inclusion is, is uh, obviously very important, right? Uh, another mistake I used to make, I wanted to recruit people who looked like me, <laughs> right? Because I was comfortable with them. Big mistake. Because you want you know, all sorts of flavors you know, from a uh, uh, you know, mental mindset, uh, problem-solving approach, uh, uh, gender for sure. Uh, you know, ethnic backgrounds, all sorts of backgrounds. That's how you get the best teams, right? For example, I believe that uh, if it had been Lehman Brothers and Sisters rather than Lehman Brothers, it would have been a different outcome, of right? Course. And certainly in the U.S. now, everybody is convinced that uh, racial diversity uh, is essential. And if, uh, if a company, if a team does not represent the customers you're serving or the community you're serving, you're going to miss. Uh, and so uh, that's why you, you, and the point about diversity and inclusion, this is not a side project. This is essential because it's essential to creating the kind of environment where everybody can be their best, the biggest, best, most beautiful 
version of themselves. So it's diversity, it's, it's, it's inclusion, it's creating a sense of belonging, uh, and that's, uh, that's essential. Now, to your point is, is you know, at the bottom when you, when you recruit, or you know, for the younger generation, one thing that's true is that 100% of uh, leaders were born, but uh, probably no leader was born a leader. And all of us get, this is what you're doing, gets to work on becoming a better leader. And so a key role we have as leaders is to help you know, our coworkers and our teams uh, grow. Here's another thing I learned from a leadership standpoint. Traditionally, you know, the role of the leader was to set goals, evaluate performance, and reward performance. I remember a boss uh, earlier in my career who said, uh, I really appreciate effort, but I really care about results. And I think he was wrong. The point about the incentives is the same. You know, in, in goal setting and uh, in, in evaluating performance. Our coworkers don't need our help to see whether they are meeting or exceeding their goals. They can read, right? So if we just tell them you're meeting or exceeding, you know, they can actually, actually can read. Our role is much more to help them grow. So it's the role of a leader as a coach. Um, and one of the things that's really cool we did at Best Buy was uh, have coaching at scale for 100,000 people, every blue shirt on a weekly basis at a meeting with their supervisor, which was a coaching meeting, not a yelling meeting, congratulations for achieving your goal. Oh, you didn't achieve your goal. No, no but more about, let's see how you're doing. Let's see how, you know, what are the areas where you can get better. Your performance, how you do performance evaluation is another one that's an interesting piece. How excited have you been when you had a performance review where your boss told you these are three things you did well and three things you need to work on? Have you had performance reviews that sounded like this? Yes. yes. How exciting was this? Who, who felt it was very exciting? Zero percent. We do these surveys. It's very scientific. Professor Durand, we do research. <laughs> okay. So at the end of my tenure at Best Buy, I, I completely changed the way I would do performance reviews with my team. Uh, they would come prepared, and they would be the one telling me, this is what I'm excited about that we've done in the last six months. These areas, uh, I felt we struggled, you know, not so good. Looking ahead, these are the things I'd like to focus on, and this is my plan to get better at these things. And my job, or my role in these discussions was number one on the first part, I think you're sure changing yourself. You were actually so much better than what you've just described. Let me pile on. And then on the fourth part, the action plan, I have a simple question. How can I be helpful? And so it's a performance review that's uh, you know, self-driven, right? It's driven by the employee as opposed to driven by the boss who you know, tells the employee what they need to do. I, I thought it was a game changer. And believe me, you know, the, my team members, our team members, were so much smarter about their own performance that it could have ever been because they're with themselves all the time. And we gave them also a coach and they did a 360 degree feedback. You guys probably do this. So they knew. So it was, I thought it was a, a better way to do it. I mean, I really love this piece of, uh, of, of, of your discussion because it sounds to me like we don't have so much to look for, in fact, translations. I mean, from reading a book of a CEO, you can imagine that we say, how would we decline or how would we transform that or translate that at various stages of management? And in the very end, if I take you correct, I mean, there's no real methodology apart from being authentic or from being open to, uh, to the people that we have around. Or, or you still have some derivations from the way you translate purposeful leadership at certain levels of management versus others? Oh, it's real work. And that may be the, the, the thing I learned the most about. You know, in a sense, you know, defining the purpose was, you know, was work and defining the strategy was, was important. We did some good work there. Uh, but one of the things I, I believe is that defining what to do is the easy part. Uh, the, the key piece of the work was the work on creating the environment for the you know, 100,000 people to, to really flourish and, and, and do magical things like in the story with the, the dinosaurs. And this is softer, but it requires a, uh, really an orchestration of, of, uh, of activities. In the book, I talk about the ingredients 
of creating human magic. Again, that's not typically what we learn. What I learn at business school now, this is so much better than. Uh, but my, you know, a few years ago, uh, last century, the model was you take a bunch of smart people, they create a plan, they communicate the plan, and they expect people to, to follow the plan. You put incentives in place to create that outcome. And you know, incentives are interesting. Financial, there's research that shows that financial incentives actually deteriorate performance. They don't increase performance. Right? And it's understandable because if we're too, when we're too focused on a goal, we get more tense. Right? If I'm serving you know, the final game of the Davis Cup and the fate of my country depends on my you know, scoring two aces, I'm going to be very nervous. I need to loosen up. Right? And so focusing on the goal is not a good thing. And the other thing is that uh, if you use carrots and sticks as the main instrument, people are going to behave like donkeys. If you treat people like donkeys, they're going to behave like donkeys. We don't want donkeys to be you know, in key roles in our organization. And so it's much more this idea of creating an environment where people can find meaning, where there can be authentic human connections, where you can create autonomy for people, where you can create a learning environment, and when you can create a growth environment. That sounds easy, but here's another amazing turnaround story of the last decade, which is Microsoft. Right? When Satya Nadella took over, it followed 10 or 15 years of T.F. Balmer in a completely flat share price. The resurgence of Microsoft in, you know, since 2014 is not so much the strategy, because here's the strategy that Satya and his team adopted. We're going to be cloud first and mobile first. Everybody can say this, right? So that's not difficult. His entire focus was on refreshing the, perp the mission of Microsoft, not about the PC, but is augmenting people's capabilities, and on changing the culture, and embracing a growth mindset, and uh, emphasizing empathy as a key leadership attribute. And that was his emphasis. Thank you. Unfortunately, I don't think that we can hug you for the entire afternoon, so I'm going to create some space for, for our colleagues. Um, Mr. Jolie, first of all, thanks a lot for such an insightful discussion. Well, I would like to, I would like to ask you to a bit share your experience in negotiation because it's like our day, daily life, you know. Uh, can you please recall one negotiation that was very tough and challenging to you and uh, why it was challenging and how did you succeed in that negotiation case? Uh. Well, uh, maybe I'll give the example with the vendors. It's back to this idea that uh, zero-sum games are a problem. One approach in the turnaround could have been to go to our vendors, who so Samsung and Apple and Microsoft, and try to squeeze them. We need better terms than Wal If you want us to survive, you need to give us better terms than Walmart and Amazon. Uh, I don't think it could have gone very far. Uh, so instead, we created a win-win-win outcome. One of the views that I had when I took the job was that, uh, of course, customers needed Best Buy, but also the vendors needed Best Buy. You know, these are companies that spend billions of dollars on R&D, and they needed a place where to showcase the fruit of their billions of dollars of R&D investment. Because if you take a TV or a speaker, if it's at Walmart in a box or on Amazon just a vignette, you won't hear the sound. You won't see the picture quality. It, it, it's not going to work. And so in December of 2012, uh, J.K. Shin, the then CEO of Samsung Electronics, flew to Minneapolis. These were our darkest days. And you know, he had, as an alternative, he could have built stores like Apple was doing. And instead, uh, you know, over dinner, we did a deal that said that in a matter of months, he was going to have 1,000 stores in the US, great locations, great traffic, Great for the customers, because they can compare you know, Apple and Microsoft and Samsung. Great for Samsung, because you know, it took them months instead of years. And great for us, because I called it my OPM strategy, or other people's money strategy. 
oh, it's my money. It was just in the wrong banking account strategy. And it helped us with our financials. Uh, and so, in so many cases, you know, the risk is to focus on zero. So, so when we lead an, an organization, it's tempting to say we're going to be number one or number two. We're going to become, we're going to beat Amazon. We're going to beat Walmart. I think that the, the a better approach is to say, let's become the best version of ourselves. Let's do an amazing job of addressing customer needs. And let's partner with others. So the other interesting partnership we did was with Amazon. All right? uh, a lot of our competitors were refusing to sell Amazon products like the, the Kindle. And Best Buy had always sold the Kindle because we thought it was a great product and we were here to serve customers. And then years later, based on the trust that the two organizations had built, we entered into a, a, a strategic partnership with Amazon where they gave us the exclusive rights to the Fire TV platform to be embedded in smart TVs. And Best Buy would have exclusive rights to this. Best Buy would be the only place in the US where you could buy these TVs. And we could sell them also uh, on Amazon as well. And uh, when we announced the deal with Jeff uh, Bezos, you know, we had the media there, the Wall Street Journal, and Variety, and, and, and the Star Tribune, and, and whatnot. And Jeff said, look, a, 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 a TV purchase is a considerate purchase. Uh, you need to see the TV. And Best Buy is the best place in the world to see the TV. Imagine the reaction from the media. Their jaws just dropped, right? <laughs> Uh, and so I think it's back to this idea that if we can find, if we can refuse the zero-sum games uh, and find win-win outcomes, you know, it's a much better thing. We did do some twist arm twisting, if I'm completely, <laughs> you know, complete. When in our dark days, for a couple of months, we, we told uh, the, the companies that were providing uh, like computer equipment or, you know, uh, uh, UPS and so forth, we're in a temporary difficulty. If you could give us a temporary 10% discount, we would appreciate it and we'll remember this. And everybody, so sometimes if you just ask, we need your help, and they, they all helped us. Yep, thank you. I have a question. Um, you emphasized on the importance of being authentic in your leadership style. And as we are here in a French business school and you are a French national, I was wondering, is there thing, anything particular about you as a Frenchman in your leadership style, or a European? So is, is my thesis particularly French, is your question? Yes, in your style, is there thing, anything particular French uh, that is part of your authenticity yeah. that's particular? I, 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 in the US, yeah, in America. Yeah, I think that the, the, the key principles I'm advocating, and that I'm describing in the book, uh, are universal principles because they touch our humanity. Right? You've, if you read the book, the first part is about, it doesn't start with business, it starts with the individual and our quest for meaning, our attitude towards work, right? Is work a uh, curse because some dude sinned in paradise? Uh, uh, or is work something we do so that we can do something else that's more fun, like you know, playing tennis or skiing? Uh, or is work part of our quest for meaning and our search for fulfillment in life? Uh, and I think that you know, what, what unites us across the globe is our, in our soul, in our hearts, the, the desire to find meaning uh, and the desire to do something good to others. You, you find it in all cultures. Uh, whether in, in all spiritualities, whether it's the monotheist phase um, or you know, the, some of the great spiritualities in Asia, Hinduism, Buddhism. Um, so I think these are f very universal uh, things. Uh, you know, I love this quote from Khalil Gibran, the Lebanese poet, who said, work is love made visible. Love is the universal you know, value and, and, and thing that moves us. And in a sense, the reason why it's called the heart of business is because and it's a bit, you know, paradoxical, but business is about love. In The Godfather, if you remember, you have Tessio talking to the conciliere, uh, saying, tell Michael I actually liked him. It was only business, nothing personal. I think business is very personal because a company at the end of the day is a human organization 
made of individuals you know, working together. And so I think these are universal truths. And it's our individual decision on how we want to lead. Now, I think for some of us in France, there's some unique challenges, right? Because in France, because of laicite, we've been trained to keep our spiritual life private, to have our head cut off from the rest of the body. And we've been trained, you know, when I was growing up in France, a great compliment to a leader or a CEO was, oh, he's brilliant, usually a he, right, at the time. He's brilliant. And so, we've, so that exists in our mindset, but it's not in our, I've checked, it's not in our DNA. It's not in the French DNA. It's just made up. And so we get to decide uh, what kind of leader we want to be. And by the way, you know, I, I'm not, I'm trying not to, I would like to be arrogant. The approach I'm advocating, that's not the only approach uh, on how to lead. I'm not going to even say it's the best. It's one way. And every one of you gets to decide how you want to lead. I, I'm just thinking that this is not a bad one, but everybody gets to decide. Mr. Jolie, if I could have a follow-up question. We are indeed at uh, HEC Paris's campus, uh, Julio Josas, and um, the hundreds of people here are accompanied by thousands uh, on the social networks that you, we all know they don't need advertising. And Charles asks a question. Um, you've supported the creation of a dedicated chair on purposeful leadership uh, at this business school. Do you think business schools are adequately equipped to train the future purposeful leaders, and perhaps you could compare with your experiences of students and teaching in the Harvard Business School. I think the, uh, and hello everyone who is following online, uh, the intuition we had, right, uh, Professor Durand, four years ago, when we were discussing that uh, chair focused on purposeful leadership, was that uh, historically, the focus of business education had very much been on techniques, you know, finance, marketing, supply chain, and whatnot. I think our view was uh, the best leaders are actually not the leaders who are the best at calculating a net present value. I'm not saying you shouldn't study net present value. It's a, it's a, it's a mean, but that's not what's going to make the difference. What makes the difference, when I look up to the leaders I admire the most, is who they are and how they behave. So there's, you know, in education we talk about uh, you know, knowledge, we talk about doing, and we talk about being. So the being part, I think, was being underrepresented in the curriculum. And we thought with uh, Peter Todd at the, at the time, right, and of course Professor Durand, that we, we had to change that because our mission in business education is to help prepare leaders to do a great job in, in the world. And I'm, I must say, I am thrilled. Uh, I know Professor Durand is listening, but I'm just amazed by the progress the school has made uh, in the last three or four years. I'm, I'm so delighted. And I think other business schools, of course, are embracing also the same idea. I think in Europe, uh, Said at Oxford is well known for this with Colin Myers and, and others. Uh, at HBS, we have some great uh, uh, programs and, and professors. Uh, we have a program called Authentic Leader Development. Um, leadership in corporate accountability. Uh, Professor Rebecca Anderson, you know, is uh, putting a lot of emphasis on uh, sustainability. Uh, together with Professor Amy Edmondson, we've, we're, we're, we're developing a program called Putting Purpose to Work, which is very much, you know, the, the, the same. And it's not a competition because everybody needs to move and not everybody gets to come to HEC Paris, right? Uh, it's very selective, you know? <laughs> and so I think it's, you know, my view, in many ways, I'm the eternal optimist. But during the crisis the last two years, I had to slow down, like probably many of you, and say out loud, the world we live in is not working. Right? We have a health crisis. We have an economic crisis. We have societal issues, racial issues, environmental issues, geopolitical tension. It's not working, maybe for a few people. But in general, it's not working. And what's the definition of madness? Right? Do the same thing and hope for a different outcome. So I think that as leaders, we have this fabulous opportunity, also responsibility, you know, to try to create a, a future that does not exist yet, but then needs to be better. And I think that the fact that HEC Paris and other schools 
are working hard to equip future leaders to be better leaders and to help solve these ticking time bombs is a, is a great endeavor. And again, congratulations to Professor John. So the last few days, we thought more deeply about the purpose of the companies that we work for. And I think a lot of us got inspired in really thinking deeper about that. Now, most of us are not CEOs. What is your recommendation for the sort of the middle management to actively contribute creatively to the idea of purposeful leadership? Do it in our own units or try to influence you know, the big company going up to the CEO? Yeah, the, um, and, and you know, the um, ability of CEOs to, to get things done is very limited, very overrated. So don't assume that CEOs are very powerful. And uh, I think that a mindset I love is to say, I have the job I have. And what I can do is focus on doing the best job I can in the job I have. And yes, I can be ambitious, I can be driven to, do, to want to do more, but you know, there's nothing like the job I currently have. And when you th we think about it, there's so many ways. You know, we can uh, define how we lead an organization. Uh, and that can, can start with a conversation with your team. I remember one of the, I'll give you this as a very specific thing we did. Uh, I think it was 2016. So every quarter we would get the executive team together for uh, an offsite. I think you talk about it in the case, right? And uh, to work on our strategy, our plans. And one time we asked every member of the executive team to come to the offsite with a picture of themselves when they were little. And then over dinner during the evening, we shared with each other our life story. And we shared with each other our purpose in life. It took us a while, you know, the entire evening. But at the end of the evening, we were able to say, look, number one, everyone on the executive team is actually a human being, not just a CFO or CHR or CMO, a beautiful but also quirky, messy human being. And number two, with a couple of exceptions, all of us share the same kind of goal in life, which is to make a positive difference on other people, like the golden rule. And then we say, we step back and say, well, look, we're the leadership team of Best Buy. Why don't we use the platform we have to make a positive difference in the world and create an organization that employees are going to love, customers are going to love, our vendors are going to love, the community is going to love, and our shareholders are going to love. In that dinner conversation, which was for the executive team of Best Buy, could have taken place with, within any team within Best Buy. And so that's the idea of being curious about the purpose of people around you. And then discussing together, how do we coalesce these individual purposes and try to collectively create an amazing outcome is something that's, that's in our control. And again, because there's the view that uh, pursuing purpose is not at the detriment of performance. It's actually a way to create amazing performance I think that can be done in a very, uh, on a very broad basis. Returning to our online uh, audience, um, and apologies in advance for the several questions which we won't be able to fit in, but Bogdan has been particularly prolific. He sent us half a dozen. One of them is, how do you decide when to give priority to financial performance against uh, ESG, uh, environmental, social, and corporate governance? Um, and how do you explain that to, to your sh uh, shareholders, your, your stance and your decision? You know, again, so one of the things I learned from a client was uh, it's a very useful trick. 98% of the questions that are asked as either or are better answered as and. Right? Should we focus on financial performance or ESG? And. If you, if you look online, you, it's not easy to find, but you can Google it and say Best Buy Renew Blue Invest Today. You'll see the original presentation. And you'll see that even though this was a time when we were supposed to die, when we laid out our priorities, we had priorities around people, around customers, around our vendor partners, around the economics, and around community and being a good citizen in the world. Right? And we, had, uh, we, we boosted our recycling program. We launched this initiative around the Best Buy Teen Tech Centers, partnering with a lot of our vendors. Now, of course, you know, if that was the only thing we had focused on, again, the investors would have said, Hubert, come on, just wake up, please. 
uh, but we were focused on the other things. But the, the fact that everybody at the company felt that we were going to do this the right way. This was not about slashing and burning, but we could be proud of the way we had done it, uh, I think was very, very powerful. The one thing I would say is that uh, we didn't start with purpose. And we didn't start with you know, a lot of the magic stuff. We started by fixing. Right? Very, it's like uh, the, during the IBM turnaround in 1993, you know, one of the things that Lou Gerstner, the then CEO of IBM, said at the time was, the last thing that IBM needs at this point is a vision. We need execution. So we knew that the leverage point was fixing what was broken. But it didn't need to be uh, constructed as you know, being jerks, and then we'll be nice. No, we, the approach was very human-centric and very holistic but it was focused on things we could immediately control and, and address. Thank you for coming here. Uh, you talk about purposeful leaders needing to create the future that isn't here yet. You talk about creating win-win-win opportunities with suppliers and competitors. Uh, what do you think the role is for governments and for NGOs or UN, and how can businesses help create a purposeful future by collaborating and partnering with them? So the role of governments, uh, well, governments uh, have become increasingly dysfunctional, unfortunately, but government has a, has a big role to play. As an example, if you take the environment, creating a price for carbon is a great way because the, one of the follies of the, of the world is that in a company p &L, you don't incorporate the externalities, right? And so as a result, we're burning the planet and my three granddaughters are going to look at me and say, happy, not good. Uh, so governments can help with that. Governments have a role also uh, in you know, antitrust uh, policies. You know, and it's, it's a very interesting field these days, because if you think about it for a second, at least in the US antitrust uh, you know, regulation was derived to protect the customers and, and make sure that prices would not uh, go up. The problem today is that. Uh, Sometimes the predatory practices of some of the players is in a context where it's free for the customer, right? And uh, prices go down, and yet it's still predatory. So we need, so government needs to keep up with the, with, with the times. Uh, so I think government clearly has a role uh, to play. The thing is that as a leader in a company, uh, you can, uh, you know, if you believe that we need this refoundation of business and capitalism, we can wait for the government to fix the environment. You're saying, let's not do that, right? I agree with you. All right, so let's do everything that's in our control. And now we can collaborate. So as an example, so in Minnesota, uh, one of the things that Best Buy is doing today under the leadership of Corey Barry is partnering with other great Minnesota companies and the governor to make it easier for families to have broadband access. Because right, there's some rural parts or some disadvantaged parts of Minnesota where you don't have good broadband aspect. Why is Corey, my successor, focusing on that? Well, very simply because if the children of our employees cannot learn from school during times of confinement, our employees are going to freak out or they're going to resign. And so it's, it's a good thing for, for business. So there's this uh, Alexis de Tocqueville in the 19th century when he was visiting the US was impressed by this mindset uh, of we're in charge of the community, right? And uh, uh, if we see something, do something. And so I think that's a great mindset for leaders to not wait for governments to act. Same with, you know, when the U.S. withdrew from the Paris Accord. Most companies said, no, no, <laughs> we're here. We're just going to do it. So again, it's this idea that as a leader, I decide I'm going to show up. I'm not going to blame others. It's interesting in retail, sometimes when you have retailers who report poor earnings, they blame the weather. If you have noticed, when they have great earnings, they, they never talk about the weather. <laughs> True. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question. Um, we've been talking a lot about purposeful leadership and how it's done and how to implement it, but at the end of the day, although you're very inspiring and the story of Best Buy is very inspiring, it's very hard to see purposeful leadership in other companies today. 
Hmm. And I was wondering, why is that? Is it because it's too hard? Is it because the first hurdles are very complicated? Is it because to buy internal stakeholder are, is a hard thing to do? What is the reason that it's not something that's very commonplace today? My observation, uh, which is in part biased by the fact that I'm in the US, is, uh, is this. Most companies I know are actually driven by a purpose. They agree with the thesis in the book. In fact, you've seen in August of 2019, 181 companies, member, uh, members of the Business Roundtable, which is the largest companies in the US, we all signed a statement about corporate purpose and serving all stakeholders. And the reason people embrace this is very simple. Uh, one, you know, there's pressure from all stakeholders, including shareholders, to move in that direction. And B, they know it's the right thing to do, and they know it's, the, it's a good way to create value for everyone, including the shareholders. And I'm on the board of uh, Johnson & Johnson, as really you, you mentioned. Johnson & Johnson, in 1943, wrote down their credo. Is anybody from j, &J in the room? OK, no? Uh, they wrote down their credo. I encourage you to look at it online. And it's, it's multi-stakeholder capitalism before it was invented. It's all about serving patients, serving families, serving doctors, uh, serving the communities, and finally, serving the shareholders. So I think it's not a question of conviction. The challenge I think that people run into is that it's hard. It's really hard because most of us, self-included, have been wired differently. And what we're talking, so in the book, there's this quote in uh, July of 1789, Louis XVI, who of course was the king of France at the time, after the storming of the Bastille, turns to Monsieur de la Rochefoucauld and asks him, uh, is this a revolt? And Monsieur de la Rochefoucauld famously, of course, answered, no, sire, this is a revolution. And what we are talking about is, is indeed a revolution. It's not completely new, because there's great examples in history of very purposeful companies. But this approach requires to rethink you know, what is a company, what is the ultimate goal of the company, to rethink how we do strategy anchored in purpose, to rethink how we treat our employees, to rethink how we emb uh, embrace all stakeholders, to rethink how we treat profit as an outcome, to rethink how we, uh, our role as a leader, which is much more to create this environment, to rethink how we need to move from being a very smart, hard-charging superhero leader to somebody who creates this magical environment. And because this is about human beings behaving differently, this is hard. I don't know about you guys, but I found it throughout the story of my life really hard to change, which is one of the recommendations I would have for anybody, is as you continue to move forward, is to get help. You know, have a coach, have a personal board of director, have a, you know, a, a therapist, a, a great partner, um, you know, do whatever it takes to get help because it, it, it is hard to change and to, to be the kind of leaders that we need to, uh, to address the challenges that we have in the world. That's what I would say. This sounds like a very different type of engagement, uh, although we may fear from how much that is invading, and, uh, but still very interesting. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, it's an honor to be in the same room as yourself. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, would you like to share an experience uh, uh, about a failure that you may have faced during your middle management years, and what did you learn from it? Yes. Yes. Um, how much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> as much as you can spare. Uh, okay. So I remember I was at McKinsey and Company, and I was a manager, I think maybe a, a junior partner. And for the first time in my life, um, we did, uh, I, had, uh, I was the recipient of a 360 degree feedback process. Uh, raise your hand if you've had a 360 in your life, yes, many of you? Okay, everybody, okay. Maybe it's part of the program here at the school. Yeah. Yeah. And so there were some bright spots and there was uh, other spots. And I was frozen. First, I was very disappointed in myself, back to this being perfect thing. And I didn't know what to do. Because I thought that I was really good. And I was surprised that my team 
didn't realize how good I was. <laughs> All right? And um, at the time, there was no real help provided with the 360. So I did nothing. Huge failure. Right? Because if at the time I had asked for help, maybe I would have made fewer mistakes along the way. And so I find that one of the mistakes we make as leaders it's interesting because Otan and I are currently coaching a, um, a CEO of a, a great company, and he's facing challenges, and he kept canceling uh, his appointment with us as his coaches because he thought next week it would be solved. All right? Uh, and so asking for help, being vulnerable and saying, I don't know. I need somebody, and being okay with not being perfect. Uh, th these are things that, uh, with hindsight, you know, uh, would have been good to address earlier. Thank you very much for being with us today. It's an honor for us. Uh, going back to based by experience, you've done great things in there and you've achieved great things in there and we're looking up to it. But what went wrong for best by in Chinese market? And uh, what are the main takeaways that you've got for yourself that we can learn from? Yeah, so uh, before my time, Best Buy, uh, uh, like many uh, retailers, embarked on a, inter a globalization strategy, international expansion strategy. I think Carrefour here did it, Walmart, many companies did it. And so Best Buy uh, started to open stores in China, I think in 2008, something like this, a few stores in Shanghai in particular. Um, and so, and then a few years later, before I joined the company, they were uh, shut down because they, they didn't work financially. So the, the high-level mistake was that retail is not a global business. There's no benefit in being global, except if you have a very unique mousetrap. So when, uh, in, you know, 20 plus years ago, when Amazon went into Europe, they were the lead, a pioneer in e-commerce. So they had a unique mousetrap. By the way, when they went into China a few years later, not so unique, not, not such so, so successful. Uh, and so if a business is not global, if there's no benefit of being global, then don't, right? Because you know, when you get into a foreign market, there's already somebody like you, uh, Suning, Gome in China were uh, formidable players. If you have no unique advantage, you, you're not gonna be able to compete. Now the second more technical or tactical reason is that the, the, the basic model of Best Buy in, uh, in the US was to be customer-led as opposed to vendor-led. So they were making most of the money from the customers, not much from the vendors. Whereas in China, the retail model is completely vendor-led. Uh, and the, 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 the flow of money comes from the vendor, and you see a lot of shop in shop that are completely operated, different from what we did, operated by the vendors. So Best Buy, with its model, actually created a great customer experience, but it didn't work financially because there was no money from the vendors. And so, uh, you know, sometimes, that's actually the same reason why the, you make me think, right, that Amazon failed in China. When they went to China, uh, arrogance is such a <laughs> an easy mistake to make, right? We know better. And so they went to China, thought, we're Amazon, it's gonna work. And none of their model actually worked. So now that when they went to India, they had a, very, a much more humble approach to the, to the market. So that's the, uh, that's the reason. It's OK to make mistakes, right? Because uh, then you can correct them. And so we exited China. And the US market, North American market, is a huge market. So we could grow there. So it's OK to make mistakes. A final question from our online audience, and it comes from Inba Muthu Malai, that's his first name, from India. He asks, how do we bring diversity and purpose into company culture in places where politics are dominated by polarization? And I don't need to remind you that your final years at Best Buy was under a presidency that had a certain tendency towards polarizing the society. Yeah, so the, the way I would uh, you know, talk about this is to... Uh, to observe, yes, many societies, the US included, are increasingly fragmented and fractured, which, is, uh, which, created, which creates a, a challenging environment because, of course, your employees are going to be from different factions, naturally. And at the same time, 
there's a growing expectation, certainly in the US, for companies to get involved in societal matters. And you've seen in the last five years, I've done some research on that, that uh, in the US companies have spoken about immigration laws after the travel ban that President Trump uh, you know, deployed or in favor of the dreamers uh, or on climate change, uh, even on voting rights. You know, Georgia last year passed a voting rights bill uh, that led a lot of CEOs to, to speak about this. So the, the question is when and how should companies get involved in societal matters? And of course, as, as uh, uh, company leaders, we're not elected officials. We shouldn't be confused, right? We've not been elected to run any country. Uh, and yet, there's pressure for us to get involved in some issues. So you need, the first thing is you need criteria. Is this issue one that's relevant to my business? Is it relevant to our values or to our employees? So I know, for example, when there was a travel ban against uh, majority Muslim countries, I communicated with our team internally saying, if you're a Muslim employee, know that I want you to feel safe. And if you don't feel safe, come and talk to me. I want to make sure that you feel I have your back. All right, so that was, you know, I wanted our employees to feel that we're safe. So it needs to be relevant to uh, the, the company values and employees. Uh, but it also needs to be authentic. You know, if you're a company that speaks on racial issues, and then your internal policies are completely you know, uh, you know, perpendicular, that's not going to be good. You also need to talk about the effectiveness of your issue. Sometimes just speaking about an issue can work when Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce, called uh, uh, then Governor Mike Pence, Governor of Indiana, and said, you know this bill around LGBTQ plus uh, you know, employees, we don't like this. We don't think it's good for employees, so we're just going to leave. Uh, Governor Pence said, oh, sorry, we some spelling mistakes in our bill. We're just going to correct it, right? So you have leverage, but you need to be sure that you know if you're going to do something, it needs to be effective. And then, of course, you need to look at the uh, uh, the, the business consequences. Sometimes you're going to take some actions that are going to have some consequences. When Delta Airlines uh, rescinded the discount for the National Rifle Association, the Georgia legislature threatened to eliminate a tax subsidy for Delta Airlines. And Ed Bastian, the CEO, said, look, very simple. Our values, they're not for sale. So if you want to take $50 million for us, have at it. But our values uh, are not uh, for sale. The last thing I would say is that uh, when you think about taking a stance on societal issues, think about your employees first. And if you're going to communicate outside, first communicate inside and have a conversation with the employees around why we're taking that position, what's our intent, what we expect to accomplish, so that you know, your first audience is actually the, the employees. Time is up, and for the least, thank you so much, Hubert, for being with us. I would like also to thank Nishat, Nicola, and the entire crowd of the EMBA team. Christelle, of thank course, you. as well. Thank you. What a privilege. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you everybody uh, thank you. online as well. So time is over. Um, for all of you in the room, if you'd like just to join the floor we'll make, and the stage, I mean, uh, we'll make just a, a picture with uh, Hubert all together. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Thank you. It was, it was, it was, it was really fun.